Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. We now return to our interview with Elizabeth Belisario and Amber Gilchrist discussing shirt, skip, skirt, sando. There we go. Got it in one take. Yep, totally. Oh, and just a quick show note. We did record this over a month ago, so some of the details about the Kickstarter were still in development phase when we were talking to them. All right, enjoy. So what uh, does skirt sando I'm just so happy mm. when I figured this out. Uh, in in, in Scorzando, what do you do? You have any kind of like a framework of what they can do to create that narrative? Is, is there anything in the description that kind of determines the the sort of way you structure that narrative, or is it pretty much just whatever the players want to come up with? Some of the structure comes from those features. I probably neglected to explain this properly, but. There are features established at the beginning in in setup that relate directly just to the setting you've created. And then after each scene, there is you create a new a new um, a new feature note card that relates directly to whatever just happened at that scene. In that scene, if you met a new character, then you can create a note card for that character. And then in the next scene, that note card will also be present. So you have a framework and you can, based on that note card, whatever note card is drawn and based on whatever characters are going to be in the scene next, discuss a little bit and figure out why are these people in the scene together with this feature note card? What could plausibly be happening? And then they role play it from there. We have a couple other mechanics that get used as tools for that is right at the beginning as a part of the process of developing your making your characters and your setting and stuff um you end up generating um two separate uh conflicts that exist in the world in some way and usually those don't end up being kind of the main force that the players are working against but sometimes it does but it does kind of provide a structure to work against when you're playing um and then the other thing that ends up causing it um is a mechanic called interjection where um during a scene a player can um, interject and um, kind of gain temporary narration power to uh, declare that something happened um, in the world that is either good for the players or bad for the players, or good for the characters or bad for the characters. And if it's good for the characters, then, I mean, either way, regardless, you then listen to one of the musicians play a little music and you guess what emotion they get. Um, and you hope you're right. And if you've, if you've interjected with something that's good for the characters, um, then that thing happens the way you say it does if you guess it right. But either way, you are giving up your ability to make one of your two emotion guesses at the end. So the end of the scene has to end work if you make something good happen. Um, and then if you make something bad happen, then you get like a bonus at the end of the scene um, if you can guess the musician emotion correctly. So if you make bad things happen during the scene, then the scene can end better for you. Um, And we find that that actually goes a long way towards kind of introducing, letting, introducing new conflict and introducing new um, story threads into the story and into the world um, in like this democratic process that gives everybody a chance to add a few of their own to that pool. Oh, all right. Okay. Uh, I think I get that. I think, I mean, as much as I usually get mechanics, I think I understand that pretty well. Alex, you're more mechanics uh, driven. Yes. So what's your thinking? On which part? Just in general? Yeah, just in general. What are you thinking right now? And it better not be about a damn snowman. (laughs) I'm just saying that right now. I told you, I told you let it go, Nathan. How I... Uh, I'm thinking, I'm thinking it's definitely interesting how the uh, mechanics will interact with how you're playing. I think it would be really interesting to play it. Um, that being said, I have a harder time hearing the mechanics without playing it and figuring out how it works. So I would need to have it in front of me to actually really grasp it. So that's me. Well, luckily for you, um, we have some good news on that front. Is that First of all, we have an open beta on our website right now at www.spiritsondogame.com slash beta that you can download and have a look to, through an open beta version of the rules uh, just on your own for the low, low price of nothing. Um, uh, 
And it's not a final version of the rules. The final rule set will come with um, a lot more like uh, tables for pre-generating settings and um, um, advice on how to play musically and prettier design and all of these things. Um, nice and art. And nice art. I love our art. You know, you can you can see a working version of the rules right now. Um, and then also, we're going to be on Kickstarter in October, so you can, you know, back our book then, and then you can hopefully get the real version of it, and the rule book will teach you how to play it as you play it. That is often a great way to learn, is learning as you play. Yeah. Unless you want to make a quick game, then it's the, the worst way to learn. Yes, that is also true. If you want to have a fast game, you should learn the game first. Any game. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. You're welcome. When you were mentioning the art, uh, who did you have do the uh, the artwork for the game? Um, we have this artist called Scutch. Um, on Twitter, I believe he's at Scutch Draws. He does a lot of um art for like um he does a lot of fan art for like leftist YouTubers, which okay. is a pretty weird niche spot to find him. But um, Scutch Draws. I will make sure to check that uh, out. When you were creating the rule book. Imagine that there was uh, some playtesting involved. When, when, you, when you had those people come into play it, um, I imagine that they had different varying abilities when it came to music and rhythm. Uh, for the people that were yes. kind of like on the lower end, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I got no rhythm and I don't know what to do. Did you find that this helped them kind of understand music better? Uh, did they... Were, were they able to kind of like pick it up and maybe take something away from it? Did you did you get any feedback on that? It's not quite a music theory lesson or like mm -hmm. a, a an instrument performance lesson. Our ultimate goal with it is that people will stop saying, oh, I wish I could play an instrument, but I have no talent. We're, our goal with the game is to give them a space to explore that and maybe have fun with it, even if they think they can't have fun because they're bad or something. And we've gotten feedback that that has happened for people. And that's just the best kind of feedback. Great. It's my heart. Yeah, that's, that's terrific. For, for me, I keep thinking about, oh, no, I have to know how to do things. And, uh, and I get concerned by that. Uh, but the idea that maybe I don't have to feel as concerned about it once I've played the game makes me feel uh, all happy inside and like I can let it go. <laughs> so and and I can experience less fearness and less oh. angerness, but way I'm more sorry. way more sad. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to make you sadiness. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Start a goddamn it counter. Like I wanna know how many times. <laughs> how many times Well, you know, if I don't uh if 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 I don't drown it to death. <laughs> Then, then there's there's really no point. I've said it way more than you at this point, so feel <laughs> feel good about it. I, you can pass the blame on to me at this point. I just blame Nathan for everything, honestly. So it's in every every episode, I get blamed for something. Um, I also so, um, I don't want to. We've talked a lot about like making it accessible to beginners, and that is all totally true. I also do want to like be clear to anyone out there listening who like is an established musician um that it's not like a game where you can't use any of those skills right when you have like someone who sits down and like really knows how to play a piano and gets in front of a piano while playing this game it is absolutely one of the coolest game experiences i've ever had is just being able to hear that happen one of our very early play tests well i was a music major so all of my friends were also music majors and we had like a harpist I think a saxophonist and two composition majors playing and it was just so cool. So you absolutely don't need to have that level to play this game. It's completely accessible to everyone. It's a lot of fun regardless of what level you're at. Um but if you do if you are at that next level, um definitely don't feel like you aren't going to get a chance to flex those muscles because you totally will be able to. Perfect. So if I just uh put this game down in front of like a, a professional uh, jazz session band I, I, I have to record it basically 
I have to put that up on on yes. some platform. Right. My question would be whether, like, how much experience they had in role playing games and what their background there is. That I think would be the determining factor in that case. But like, yes, yeah, basically. So, like, if I'm an improvisational musician, I'd oh, probably perfect. be. I'd be. Yeah, I'd be all set. Okay, good. Alex, with all of your music training, did you ever do improvisational? No, Nathan. I was in chorus. I wasn't in band. Oh, okay. And I'm not an sure improv is generally something like more jazzy. That's okay. Maybe not. Maybe not right. always. Yeah, but... unfortunately, in in my very, very, very classical upbringing uh, as a musician, like I basically have gotten zero improv, like formal improv training. So. This game was also for me to. It's almost oxymoronic there. Uh, improv training is that? Is that no that? formal formal improv. Oh uh, well, I mean you you do you can practice improv. It's very necessary. But um, yeah. So this game is also for me to loosen up and realize that I don't have to have everything perfect before I play something in front of people. Well, that's good. I mean, it's a confidence thing. I mean, you, you feel that in a lot of role-playing experiences anyway, that you build confidence in whatever you're doing. So so it, it makes sense to me, you know, if you have a musical-based RPG, that you would get more confident in that regard. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so this is going to be in Kickstarter fairly soon. Tell me what I can expect mm -hmm. from the Kickstarter. What, what is the, first of all, what is the goal for the Kickstarter, your, your monetary goal? We don't have a number yet. Um, we're still working on the King's <laughs> the number specifically. <laughs> All right, that's the uh, that's that's in in, in works. Okay, so we, uh, have a, we have a month before we we have over a month. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. We're still working on it. It's fine. Everything's fine. Um, Everything's fine. Um, do you have any uh tier levels yet uh, for for different pledge levels? I think we'll probably have levels for like a PDF and the physical book and um. Perhaps some add-ons like uh, physical note cards for things that occur in every game, like the character or musician assignments, stuff like that, physical tokens and stuff. We may also get like a retail tier level, but we're not really looking to have like a whole lot of tiers involved in this Kickstarter. Keep it somewhat simple. Maybe just like mm -hmm. three or so tiers so that you can, uh, it, it's easy to figure out. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Out of curiosity, just like as as I'm sitting here, I'm just starting to think to myself, do you think that this would be a, a good sort of game to have if like, for instance, you, you were students of music. If I were a, a student and I was taking music, do you see this being the kind of game that would actually help me while I was actually taking classes, learning about music? We've considered but not actually gone forth with trying to introduce this game to like elementary school music level it might be there might be kind it might be kind of mechanics heavy for that or at least there's a lot of things to keep track of but i think primarily the the benefit of playing this game for playing music is the confidence building aspect that we touched on earlier i mean i i can kind of see where the the mechanics may be a little hard for for, for really young kids but i think once you're like 12 or 13, I think you'd probably be able to get your, your head around it pretty easily. Oh, yeah. I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And for all you know, it might make people who were not necessarily thinking about music or, or had any interest in music really get, get interested in it because it's presented to them in a new way. That would be awesome. <laughs> there's, there's a goal. Was that really the intention? Like when you had the idea uh, for Skirt Sando, which I am so proud I can say. I'm proud of you. Yeah, I know. We all, hey, that was my learning experience for the night. When, when you originally uh, were, were developing it, what did you, like your most lofty uh, hope for the game, what, what was that? Oh, at the very beginning? Oh, gosh. God, do you even remember what that was? Barely. <laughs> I remember being stuck on, I was, I was still very stuck on like, music theory aspects of things that no one would appreciate except for me like i kept trying to connect things to sonata form and that's just not the way to go <laughs> i think our goal of getting people comfortable with playing music has stayed pretty consistent throughout it's a good goal to stick with and it certainly sounds like if that was your goal you've certainly seen it through to fruition to the end 
hope so. It's okay. not like private goal that doesn't actually matter for this game is just to someday be able to walk into like a game store somewhere and see it on the shelf. That's a goal that doesn't actually matter, but secretly I really <laughs> want it to happen. I I don't think you're alone in the in like the game dev community in having that that wonderful moment. <laughs> I think a lot of people really would love to see their game on a shelf somewhere and, and have that moment where you feel like you get like an emotional gold star. You get a gold star that that that's inside you. It's in your heart. I usually like gold stars that are very much actually gold stars. <laughs> but I, I'll take a I'll take an imaginary one too. On a on a shelf in a game store somewhere, I will go out and I will buy myself a gold star sticker. Honestly. <laughs> I deserve you know, that point. I, I, I cannot judge you for that. That's perfectly fine. I always want to talk about Scherzando and like the embodied experience because it's it's this is the thing I've thought about a lot with this game. Um, is that you know so much of the tabletop experience up to and including this game is about sitting like around a table, right, and just talking around the table. Mm -hmm. Um. But this thing that you see when you see people play Scherzando, and we've we've seen a lot of people play Scherzando, um, is you see people like reaching around the table and moving their chairs around to get like a better like an instrument or whatever, and like picking things up and moving things around and like using their bodies um, in like this way that you don't often see in role playing games. And I think that that's really that's an exciting thing that I like to that I like to key in on is trying to remember that like. Your players are people, and they're people with bodies, and they like enjoy using their bodies um, in just ways that a lot of games don't necessarily cater to. And I think that's one of the like one of the playful, exciting things about the game is that other than just like kind of the delight of picking up these instruments and just like seeing what sounds you can make with them, um, is also the just the delight of kind of doing that with your body and having that embodied experience is like a really rare and a really special thing in games, I think. Um, so if I can just do that much bragging about our game, I would like to say that it does that sure. in a way that most games short of like LARPing just like don't have. Right. Yeah. So it's physically interactive in a way that you don't necessarily get with, uh, you know, rolling dice. Mm -hmm. You're doing the thing with your arms or with your voice or with whatever you're doing. It's very literal role play because you have to be embodying it as you are doing it. You you are the mechanic. You and your body is a much more interesting randomizer than dice, right? Oh oh yeah. Well, if you saw me play, it would very much look random. <laughs> I'll give you that. It's going to be a very randomized experience. Uh, my my big hope is that one day I'm going to see YouTube videos where people play Scherzando. Mm -hmm. And I get to I get to see the most amazing performances by like musicians who know what they're doing. <laughs> they're their full their full attention. They're they're all. Um, I think that, that will be really. We are a little bit trying to do the podcast circuit right now. I was just on one shot with this game a few days ago. Yes. Um, James. DeMoto. So yeah, with James Tomato. So that'll be out in the near future. Hopefully a few other podcasts as well. I don't know. Let us know if you have any you think we should be on. Hook us up with those. We're trying to do that. Uh, yeah, no, uh, James, James was just on the show not too long ago. We were talking about his new book. So, uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's really great for that. Um, I will uh, also uh, suggest, just because I've had very nice interactions with him, uh, if you look for We're Not Wizards, uh, they talk okay. to so Ooh. many people. And uh, he's in. I want to say he is in Scotland. I think he's Scottish. Sure. Uh, and he's 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 an he's an awfully fun character. Cannot remember his name off the top of my head. <laughs> but he, he does <laughs> good job. But he does he does a lot of episodes on tabletop, and and he loves to uh, he loves to talk to designers. So that's a fun time. He he'd enjoy talking to you. I know. This is not a very serious game, and I think embracing that leads to really fun places as as it says in our in our little tagline it's about things going explosively wrong sometimes literally so and it's totally true that there are lots more emotions to explore than fun um but also scherzon is a lot of fun it's a yeah. wacky silly game nathan's great at wacky silly games 
And if it's not a wacky, silly game, I'll make it into one. So exactly, that's, that's my goal. But, you know, it's nice that the game actually did most of the work for me in making it a wacky, silly game. It's less on me to turn it into that. I like that. Can you imagine what you could even do with a game that is already wacky and silly? I, I'm scared to think, to be honest with you, Amber. I don't know if I want to know. <laughs> if, if we ever find out, I'll make sure to record it for you. Uh, Please do. Send it to us. Yes, we will, we will send you. Lord the... knows I have not listened to enough playthroughs of this game. <laughs> There's always room for one more. There always is. Excellent. Alex, uh, y- you know what I learned today? Um, that you don't have to know how to do music to make music. I learned how to say scorsando. <laughs> I mean, Ando. that's something you actually learned, so that's good job, Nathan. Gold star for you. And it's a real one this time. I want to thank um, Elizabeth Felisario and Amber Gilchrist for coming on the show. Thank you, uh, both of you. Thank you for having us. Thanks so much, yeah. And uh, if uh, anyone was interested in learning more about Scherzando, where could they go on the internet? Um, we have a website. It's scherzandogame.com. Let me spell that. Uh, S-C-H-E-R-Z-A-N-D-O game.com. And we're on Twitter at Scherzando RPG. Excellent. Alex, uh, if uh, they want to find out uh, more about the improvisational show called Delve. Where could they go? I mean, we're not we're not an improv show. We just we just make things up. Nathan. Well, that, but you can find more about Delve funny. over at Delvecast dot com. Uh, yeah, making things up. You know what? Never mind. Yes, you can find everything you can over at Delvecast dot com. Uh, we we really appreciate that. While you're there, uh, if you happen to be there, uh, check out our little Patreon link. We got one in the corner. And you can check out what we have over there on Patreon. Um, and uh, if you are one of our shiny level sponsors, we will say your name as, as a, a, a named person on the show. And we actually have two. So thank you to Dom Perry and Bonnie Ainsworth for being our shiny people and giving me so many stars. Literal stars. Uh, no, fictitious stars. That's fictitious, right, Alex? They didn't actually give me gold stars. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if you bought yourself any stars lately, so we're going to go with yes. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I got to go get some stars now. Damn. Uh, you can also find us on iTunes and Google Play. Make sure to rate and review and subscribe when you go. And uh, also you can find us on, on the Twitter. And I'm at Citanium. I'm at EXP Limited, and the show is at Delve Podcast. And uh, so, I want to, uh, again, just uh, thank Amber and Elizabeth for coming on and telling us all about Skirtsando. Nice. I did it. Yeah, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Uh, And um, I don't know how to end the episode. I feel like there's there's an improvisational way that I can end this episode, but I can't think of it. You know how you, you know how you end the episode, Nathan? You know how? I'm, I'm waiting. You let it go. I'm I'm feeling a certain amount of <laughs> angerness and sadness right now. It's, it's the damn it joke. I can't do it again. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it. Damn it. <laughs> oh, so, I am so full of fearness right now. Anyway, thanks for joining us, folks. <laughs> thank uh, you. It was great. <laughs> thank you uh, to everyone listening uh, on Delveness, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Perfect. Cool. That was exactly what I wanted. <laughs>
everybody, but you can't see it, so it doesn't really help me at all. It's so much easier when we're in the same room and we can just look at each other. Oh, yep. yeah. I, I know. I know. I try to avoid that with Alex. Uh, <laughs> it's better we're not in the same room. I prefer it that way. <laughs>